I don't know if you know the DNA of our church. We, we believe that church is a team sport. That every single person in here has a place to play. That this isn't a place where we come and we're entertained on Sunday because it's really not that great. But this is a place where we're inspired and we're encouraged to have, like, what are we asking? Get into Christian biblical community. I know, it's wild. It's so wild. Get into community with people that can, you can talk about God's word with. Get into community with people, and we like try and provide it, and we have all these things. We call them life groups. We want you to get involved because we know how much it matters. You know, get the opportunity to, to give grace and peace and, and love and, and, and all, of the, all of the different fruits of the Spirit. Like, get in, get in that opportunity to do that with people around you. And so we just are always asking folks, make sure that you get into community. It's super, super important for us. I'm so proud of our church. We just got our uh, real needs annual report. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but uh, I know Adam has it. And do you know we have this program called Real Needs? We have awesome people that are facilitating that, and they deliver furniture to people. I think uh, 16 of our real needs last year were, were people that were escaping domestic violence. They had to leave the house where they had all their stuff to get out of there because it was a super dangerous place, and they had nothing except they had the ability to not, not be domestically violated. And then here comes some folks bringing things that they need. And so there's, there's places to participate in our church that matter, that absolutely matter, where you're absolutely impacting the world for Jesus one person at a time. And it's not sitting in a church on a Sunday. It's good, and I'm glad you're here, and I, I love it, and welcome to those of you online. Uh, but like, we're a church of action. We're a church of application. We're a church that, like, yeah, yep, we have Sunday, it's awesome. Our worship is cool and all those things, but the action is outside of these walls. The time to meet and connect and love people and like, yes, do that. So that's all I got to say about that. I'm, I'm excited for what our church is doing. There's so many cool things that are happening. The way we bless the family, that if I, we had folks, I had folks in our life group come up to me on Thursday night. I was here for a restoration night. I started my first step study that I'm attending and, and, and excited to, to be a part of. Um, but I had a guy come up to me on restoration night and he's like, hands me a check. And I'm like, every time you hand the pastor checks, I'm like, whoa, I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to touch those. Like that goes in the tithe box. Uh, but he was handing it to me to get the money to the people from that life group that lost everything because he heard about a need. And that's what Christians do. We understand what the needs are and we fill it. So we have a need to learn more about Sabbath. You'll be very proud of me. Last weekend after church, I went to the house that I live in now. I had some lunch. I put on a movie because that's how I fall asleep. Put on a movie and I was in like the neutral position and I'm, I think I probably drool snored and everything. I was out. I did not go work on Sunday after church. I actually Sabbathed uh, after church, which I was really proud of uh, until my life group. And then we went to our life group, which was awesome. Can I tell you about my life group? We had a great life group. It was a moment, uh, I had this moment kind of backfire on me. I felt called in the life group at the end of our life group to speak a blessing on every single person in the life group about what God has shown me about them when they were in the life group. And so I did that and it was really cool. And then they all wanted to say that to me and that was like the most uncomfortable thing in the world. So don't do that. Don't speak blessing on somebody unless you want them to speak it back on you and then you're squirming in your seat, right? All right. Week two, Sabbath. Seven weeks on this, really, Josh? Yeah, seven weeks. There's lots to learn about this. So Sabbath, week two. Last week, we talked about that you were designed to work. You're designed to actually need a Sabbath because you work. How many people worked this week? Dennis and Connie, you've got to raise your hands. I know where you were this week. They worked, right? Everybody, how many people, we worked, right? We're designed to work. We're designed to take care of, of what God has given us. We're designed to be active and involved. We're not designed to be sitting behind a, a screen, sitting there playing video games and thinking that we're working and we're doing a really good job. You can play video games, that's cool, but that's not your life. 
We're designed to be active. We're designed to be out taking care of the garden, taking care of what God has given us. And you know what else God gave you besides the land and the dirt that's under your feet and your house and all of these other things? You know what he gave you to take care of? Each other. To see that you think he cares more about the dirt in the ground than he does the soul of a person that you walk by? Absolutely not. So we're designed to work. We're designed to take care of each other. One of the things we uh, look at often in our sermon club is we'll, we'll talk about this idea of the principle of first mention. Where do we first see the word Sabbath? Where do we see that in the text? And I was like, in my mind, I was like, well, yeah, God mentions that in Genesis, but that's not the word. He talks about on the seventh day he rested, but that's not the word Sabbath. The first place that we see the word Sabbath in the text is Exodus 16, and we're going to spend some time in Exodus 16. Now, let me set up Exodus 16 because I think it really, really, really shows why God wants us to Sabbath. And so the Israelites have escaped from over 400 years of bondage and slavery. Everything they did was based on performance. I was doing some more research on something. It was like they had a 10-day work week. I'm just like, wow, 10-day work week. That's a lot of work week, right? And you were, you know, it, it, was, it was slave driving. It was making bricks. And can you imagine if, like, you're, what, you're, that's your entire family's, like, that's all you know. What would your great-grandpa do? What did your great-great-grandpa do? The same thing I'm doing, <laughs> making bricks, right? And that's all you know is how many did you make? Keep up. Oh, you're falling off a little bit. I think you might be getting too old. You might not be enough to build the empire, Look at all of the buildings we must build. Look at all of these things we must create uh, in the name of all of these other gods who demand things over and over and over again. And there's the God of this and he's not happy. And there's the God of this and he's not happy. And there's the God of this and he's not happy. And there's the God of this. And you are based on performance. You perform or die. You perform or your family dies. You perform and you don't, if you don't perform well enough, you're not going to eat. And they're coming out of that culture. And that's all you knew. It's not like you're like, well, I thought I was going to be something else. No, you knew what you were going to be over and over again. So that's the, the, the place that these Israelites are coming out. Now they're free. But you know what's dangerous? Is when you're free and you don't know what to do with your freedom. And so here they are. They're free they got, they got whatever they could carry, right? And they're in, they're in the desert, and they're like, what am I, like, how are we going to live? They kind of want to eat. So that kind of leads us where, where, uh, right to where we're at in Genesis, or excuse me, Exodus 16. It says, when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was. There was this peculiar thing that was on the ground, And they had never seen it before. And so they're asking, what is it? It's the manna, right? Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some gathered little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. So I was studying this this week. I stopped and I was like, everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Like you and I did with toilet paper, with the pandemic. Just as much as you needed. So I started thinking about this. Like, like, so they did what God asked them to do. And guess what happened? They had just as much as they needed. It's a beautiful thing. Then Moses said, no one is to keep any of it until morning. Don't keep any any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part uh, part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots. And it began to smell. So Moses was angry with them because he probably didn't want maggots in the camps there. And he probably didn't like the smell of it. And he probably was disappointed that they didn't listen to the instructions that he felt God had told them. Have you ever got too much of something and you're like, there's a stench here. Like, I'm too, I'm too, I'm overcommitted into this. I got too much of this going on in my life. There's too much. It's, it's, too much can be too much, right? 
So each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. And on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person. And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. And he said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest. Wait a minute. Tomorrow is to be a day of ceasing. Ceasing of this work of gathering the basics of food. A holy Sabbath as to the Lord. It's not just any kind of day of rest or ceasing. It's a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning and Moses commanded and it did not stink or get maggots in it, which is a bonus. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is the Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day. No one is to go out, so the people rested on the seventh day. A couple things to think about here as we sit on the scripture. So what principle first mentioned, first place we find the word Sabbath in the text, and then he talks about it over and over and over again, most talked about com- uh, commandment in, our, in, the, uh, in the Torah. Why does he keep going back to this? A couple things to note. On the sixth day, he says, I will provide for you. I will give you double what you need so you don't have to work on that day, on the seventh day. You don't have to fear scarcity. You don't have to fear scarcity. When you trust in what the Lord gives you and has provided for you because he knows what you need, it will not stink. It will not have maggots. Who is the provision from? God. The title of the sermon, Do You Trust Do You Trust Me? Not me. Do you trust him? Do you trust him with everything? Like I want you to I want it to sift out today. I want God to reveal to all of you sitting in your seats today, right where you're at, if there's an area in your life where you're not trusting God. Because he thinks it's pretty darn important that he's different from all of those other gods he was saying. We are and I am not the God, the slave driver of your value is based on your production. Your value is what I say it is because I made you good. I made you holy. I believe in you. I made you for a purpose. I have plans for you. He has plans for you, not all of these other gods. So what is God teaching his people through the Sabbath commandment? What is he teaching his people? Even even the location of this commandment in the text is interesting. Called the, like the, I ever call the linchpin commandment, right? So you have the first four before that, which are all about your relationship with God, Right? Don't, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't, don't create any other idols, right? The Lord your God is, is, is your God alone, right? All of these different things that he's saying right there. It's all of this relationship. And there's, and there's all these things you're not supposed to do. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Do this. Don't 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 do this. Isn't it interesting? And when you're looking at it, I said this last week, when you're reading it in Exodus, you're reading it and it's like, wow, that's like a longer commandment. He says a lot about this one. He actually references an event that happened in creation. He's pretty serious about this one. So it's a positive commandment. It's the longest. It references an event. It's the the linchpin. And really what he's asking is, do you trust? 
Do you trust that he is going to provide enough or do you need to rely on you? When's the last time you put yourself in a spot where God had to come through or it wasn't gonna happen? Living on the edge of faith. Now don't test the Lord your God. (laughs) Don't test him in anything other than tithing, he said. But, but like, where you're like, oh man, I need you, Father. Help me. Do you trust him? You know, uh, the idea and the thought process about trust, there's lots of studies. You know that trust is built. It's not just like, well, you guys just trust God. See you later. Have a good weekend. Do you know how you build trust with God? How do you build trust with your spouse? How do you build trust with your parents? How do you build trust anywhere else? It's through a relationship. Okay, cool. Well, how am I gonna have a relationship with God? Well, what do most relationships take right away? You can say it. Time. Who said that? My man right there. God bless you. It takes time, right? It takes time for you to have a relationship with your mom and dad. It takes time to have a relationship with God. Now, could that amount of time that you spend with him dictate what kind of relationship you have? Is it like a high howdy drive-by? Hey, good to see you. Is that the relationship you have with God? Just kind of just the drive-by? Hey, call you later when I need you. Or is there time where you're with your holy father? You have his text open. He's talking to you. You close his text. You're worshiping him. It's just you and him, and he's just speaking to you. Because in order to have trust with God, we need to have uh, time with God. Ever notice the bond in brotherhood or sisterhood when you have experiences with people? What do you think, uh, the gentleman who lost his house, what do you think his experience is with his life groups? People that are stomping through a, a, a house together, pulling out stuff and hoping that there's something to salvage. Do you think it's about what you're salvaging or do you think it's about the people that were there with them to help them salvage? It's about that community. It's about that connection, doing life with people, being vulnerable with people. Where are you needing to trust the Lord? Exodus 16 is asking, will you trust and obey me? Will you believe God's promise that he will take care of you? Now his enough and your enough might be different, but his enough is better than your enough. I promise. You can be destroyed by your enough. You will not be destroyed by God's enough. So well, I ask questions I ask myself, God has offered me a gift. It's a great gift of Sabbath. Will I let go of my endless desires that keep me enslaved? I have like voluntary slavery sometimes. You voluntarily put yourself in spots to need things, to have to do extra stuff to make it all happen. Is it worth it? Or will you trust God, pursuing restfulness as the center of your life, a true Sabbath rest? So you have the power. You have the power to choose. You can choose Sabbath or you can not choose Sabbath. You can choose a, a time of ceasing. You can choose to trust God or you can choose not to trust God. One of them is going to lead to a very different path. Remember, the people that are hearing this are, are understanding that like, they know bricks. They know exhaustion. They know endlessly being demanded over and over and over and over again. More bricks, more bricks, more bricks, more cities, more cities, more wealth. Build things for my, for my, for my uh, grain. Build things to, to glo- who? What are we building for? Who are we trying to glorify? I doubt that 4,000 years later, we are much different. I know I'm not. Working for the world, working for the things of this world leads to exhaustion and self-induced slavery. But trusting that God has enough and that he is enough that's going to lead to, to, to a, rest, a rested life.
That's going to lead to a quality of life that, that uh, that's going to lead to restoration. See what I did there? Restoration, right? So Sabbath is a sign of a covenant a relationship with, with God and ourselves. And he's so serious about this relationship. Let me read to you how serious he is about this relationship, specifically with the Israelites. Exodus 31, in my Bible, it was titled, The Sabbath. So here we are, 15 chapters later, he's still talking about Sabbath. What is he saying about Sabbath? Then the Lord said to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for generations to come so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Who makes you holy? God makes you holy. How, does, how do you become holier? By spending time with God. Letting him knock off the pieces. Come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. How many people need, have some making that needs to happen in their life? I got all kinds of making to happen in my life. That's why I'm in a step study. I'm not in there to check up on my call. I'm not in there. To, I'm in there for me. And I told those guys that I'm here for me because I got some issues that I want to uncover. I got issues I don't even know I got. I'm not overly excited about uh, discovering all those, but I got to go through the journey. He makes us holy. Observe the Sabbath because it is holy to you. Okay. Anyone who desecrates it is to be put to death. Be an empty church here next week, wouldn't it? Who would preach? Those who do any work on that day must be cut off from their people. For six days, work is to be done, but on the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. Didn't he say that already? The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath and celebrating it for generations. This is kind of cool. Wait a minute. Are we going to actually celebrate that we have a God who's going to take care of us and who is enough and who has given us enough? And that's what we set that day aside to do. We're like, woo! Check out our God. Look at him. He says that we have enough. He says that it's enough. Let's celebrate The Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant. This will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he wants you to be working out of a place that is refreshed. So we welcome the God of the Sabbath, the God who gave us rest, which leads to restoration. I don't see a lot of unrested people finding restoration. They find the next thing. Sabbath is our gift. It becomes a gift when we recognize it. So it says our recognition that God will close the gap between what we have accomplished and what needs to be done. Sabbath is our recognition that God will close the gap between what we have accomplished and what needs to be done. He recognized what you needed. He knows your name. Right? There's a song that says he knows your name. He knows every hair on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows what you need. Are we bold enough to go to the Father and, and ask him, Lord, show me what I need. Tell me. I want to observe this. I want to, I want to trust you. You know what happens when a church wholly trusts in, in God? It flourishes. It flourishes out of obedience. And we're a church that's flourishing. We, want to, we, we are flourishing, and we are trying to obey God the best that we can. Now, I mess up often, and so do you. But we get back on track and ask that question, how, how am I trusting you today, God? Am I trusting you enough to know that, that it's going to be okay? I can focus with you that we're going to celebrate today what you did all week long. So he recognized what we really needed. He gave us our model, Jesus Christ. 
And so as we enter into a time of communion, I want us to, to, to just, just sift ourselves. We're going to take a couple minutes here. We're going to commune with God. I want you to ask some questions to God as we do this. So join me in prayer before we enter communion. Father God, uh, as I saw it this week, Lord, in your text and where you led me, Lord, is that uh, one of the big reasons why you've given us the Sabbath commandment is you want to give us the opportunity to trust you. To trust that you're enough. To trust that you're enough for our finances. To trust that you're enough for our relationships. Lord, as we just come to the table, I ask you just just be working right now in this room, right now, right where people are sitting. And gently show us, Lord, where, where are we not trusting you? Lord, thanks for showing me where I'm in violation of the Sabbath commandment, not just in an action, but in an attitude and in a heart and in a mind of how I trust you. Reveal it to us, Father. Where where are we not wholly uh, trusting to you? Where have we haven't where haven't I given it up to you, Lord? Because you're so serious about us. You see us. You hear the cries of the oppressed. You hear us when we call out to you. Do we call out? Lord, as, I, as, I, as we come to your table, I just want to take this opportunity, Father God, if there's any unconfessed sin, if there's stuff that's going on uh, in our lives, Lord, uh, that, that we confess it to you right now. We come to you, Lord, and ask for your forgiveness. All the things that are popping up in everyone's head in here today, Lord. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We want to be in right relationship with you. Lord, we lift up all the folks that are around us, uh, that are within our families and our extended families and friends, Lord, that are, that are hurting. They're physically hurting. They're physical illnesses, Lord. We ask for your interv- you to intervene. People that have uh, hurts that are, that are in their hearts and in their minds and deep in their soul that have scarred their hearts, that they allow you to enter and be the restorer that you are. And we would accept that, that we would start repairing relationships, Father God. We come together to, to commune with you and with each other. Lord, we pray for those that are far from you, that don't know who you are. You would reveal that to us, Lord, that we would be people that, even though we're scared sometimes, that we would be people that would evangelize. We'd be people that would say like, hey, uh, man, I don't know about you, but I, but I want to introduce you to something that's changed my life. Take a risk. Because you are the way, the truth, and life. We want to introduce people to you, but no one comes without being introduced to Jesus. So we just ask that you would just help us to see that. So for all of those folks that are lost, all of our family members that are lost, that don't know if they're enough, that don't know how to trust. And lastly, Father, we just come to you humbly. We humbly come to you. We praise you and we thank you for what you did by giving your son to us. By giving your son to us on a cross. So that we can look to a model. Help us have community. Help us have the connection like you gave your son to us. Help us to have that same passion. So we come to you, Lord. We come to the table.
on the night he was betrayed. He took the bread and he looked at all his disciples. He said, this is my body. This is my body, which has been given for you. When you do this, do this in memory, memory of me. Let's, let's remember who our Father in heaven was and who his Son was. In the same way, uh, he had uh, come with this cup. He said, this is my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming something. You are proclaiming what the Lord has done in your life. You're remembering that time, the time of salvation when you accepted Jesus into your life and how you are changed forever because of it. So we proclaim you, Father. Lord, thanks for this day. Um, Lord, I ask you would just take people to where you want to take them this week in their text, time, time as they study in the text, that you would speak powerfully to people through worship, that we might turn off some of the news and turn you on, turn you on in our, in our hearts, that we would care as much about what you have to say as we do about What, the, what, what our media has to say. We would care more because you speak truth, Father God, in a mighty way. And so I ask for your healing hand upon our country. I ask for your healing hand upon our hearts. And I ask that we would engage you this week in a mighty and powerful way. And I say that in Jesus' name, amen.